Welcome to the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation's Meet the Scientist monthly webinar series. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein, BBRF's President and CEO. Today, Dr. Aaron Kalapari will present Sex Differences in Mental Health Disorders. BBRF is the world's largest, largest private funder of mental health research grants, supporting transformative discoveries in order to develop improved treatments, cures, and methods of prevention. The high quality of the research we fund is made possible by the BBRF Scientific Council. This group of 186 prominent mental health researchers reviews each grant application and selects the most promising ideas with the greatest potential to lead to breakthroughs. The Scientific Council guides the foundation to fund creative and impactful basic translational and clinical research relevant to the whole spectrum of mental health. One reason that research funded by BBRF has had such great impact is because we do not limit our focus to one illness or condition. Since 1987, the foundation has awarded more than $440 million to fund more than 6,400 research grants around the world and across a broad spectrum of brain illnesses, including addiction, ADHD, anxiety, autism, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, depression, eating disorders, obsessive compulsive disorder, post-traumatic stress, schizophrenia, as well as suicide prevention. Today, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Aaron Kalapari. Dr. Kalapari is Assistant Professor of Pharmacology and Biophysics at the Vanderbilt University Center for Addiction Treatment, Addiction Research. She was a 2019 Friedman Prize winner and a 2016 Young Investigator. Our webinar will begin with Dr. Kalapari's presentation which will, be, which will then be followed by Q&A. To submit your questions, please use the questions tab on the control panel on your screen. Please feel free to submit your questions at any time. Following the presentation, I'll ask as many as possible in the time allotted. And now I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Kalapari. Erin, the floor is yours. Hi. Um, thank you so much for having having me today and thank you guys all for um, attending. I think, you know, Jeff and I were talking before about how important it is for these disorders to have conversations with people who span researchers, lay public clinicians to kind of communicate science and why these disorders are so devastating and what we can do to solve, um, solve these problems. Um, my work um, focuses on a lot of things, but one of my really um, big picture research questions is understanding the role that biological sex plays in psychiatric disease vulnerability. And one of the things I wanted to start with is highlighting, you know, kind of the problem and what we need to do to, to solve it. And so one of the big pushes recently has been to include females and understand female biology more in basic research. I'm going to tell you kind of why that is. And so women make up 50% of the world population, but until recently, really only a small percentage of preclinical research in psychiatric disease. The reason this is important is this stat that I think is really just kind of mind blowing. And so from 1997 to 2000, 10 prescription drugs were withdrawn from the market by the US um, Food and Drug Administration. Eight out of 10 of these drugs were withdrawn because they had greater health risks in women. Only 15% of studies even included both female and male animals in these preclinical research, uh, research projects in this 100 year period from 1909 to 2009. And what's even more staggering is among this 15%, only 34% of these even analyze data separately by sex. So in this period, only 5% of the work that was being generated by the kind of preclinical research enterprise was even capable of identifying where sex differences existed in, in behavioral strategies, in brain mechanisms of disease, 
And so what's really important moving forward as a field and what my research really focuses on is identifying kind of generating data, identifying models that understand female behavior and how their neurobiology makes them vulnerable to disease. So as I go through this talk, I think one of the things that's really kind of um, my favorite thing about the field that I'm in is how many women scientists have contributed to this work. And so as I go through, I'm actually gonna highlight some of my favorites that have really kind of um, shaped my career and how I ask questions. And so one of the things that's kind of, uh, that I think is important about this, if you're really interested in these kinds of stats, uh, Rebecca Shansky from Northeastern University has writ written a bunch of really powerful commentaries on this problem, why it exists, and what we can do as a community to start addressing this issue. And so I, I, I really like um, looking at her thoughts and kind of the, on the broader, the broader issue of this kind of, uh, this disparity. So my work fo focuses on biological sex. And so how male and females, so most of my work is done in, in rodent models, um, are different. And so what's really important to know is that biological sex isn't a behavioral determinant. And so what I mean by that is just because you're a man or a woman doesn't mean that you're going to exhibit some specific phenotype or have some sort of disorder. But what it can do is interact with environmental factors, even kind of social factors to cause men and women to distribute their behavior in different kinds of ways. And so, you know, when we think about this, when we navigate an environment, we are making decisions about how we can maximize good things happening to us and minimize negative things happening. And how we do this can dictate kind of maybe my work is mostly in the context of addiction, why we take drug in the first place. It can interfere with kind of uh, different kinds of experience dependent changes in our brain comorbidities we may have to dictate exactly what kinds of behaviors may exist between the sexes and how maybe different kinds of behavioral phenotypes are more likely to, to um, be present in, in, in women. And I'll talk about some of those and kind of what I mean by that as we go. And so what my work focuses on is really how sex differences in behavioral strategies and differences in the brain at baseline between males and females make females particularly vulnerable to addiction or even manifesting addiction in very different ways. And so when I was thinking about um, putting this, this kind of presentation together and kind of who was here and what people would be interested in, instead of going through like a single study that we did, what I wanted to do was take a step back and give this kind of big picture overview of what where I think sex differences really matter and how Research in my lab has identified these complexities and what we can do as a community going forward to start to address women's health better. And so there, I'm gonna give you know, three examples of where biological sex plays a really, really important role in psychiatric disease vulnerability and expression um, more often than not because it's what I study in the context of addiction, but also tie in how other mental health disorders and comorbidities are actually really important in, in these behaviors as well. Um, so what's really interesting in some of the early work out of my lab has shown that different ways of making decisions um, can actually influence why women take drug in the first place. And so kind of what their goal is can change what that means. And that can change kind of how addiction and addictive behaviors are, um, occur. There's a lot of situations, which I, I find actually maybe the most interesting, where males and females do the same thing or their behavior looks very similar, but they're actually, even in those cases, can be different mechanisms in the brain controlling this. And so this becomes really difficult because it becomes very difficult to say there are not sex differences here because we don't observe them in behavior, because there can be different ways to get to the kind of same behavioral endpoint. And the, the last thing I'll kind of talk about, which I think is a really important thing and, and of the work that I do is the thing I get asked about the most. Um, circulating hormones can actually influence how the brain works and how receptors function. Um, which has really important implications, not just for sex differences in general, but also for developmental time windows, drug development, and how, how drugs can even act on the systems that are even present in both males and females. And so I'll go through and kind of give this big picture with the goal of, of kind of explaining to you that sex differences are complex. 
but they're actually really interesting and provide really, really kind of interesting basic behavior, biological phenomena where we can better understand the psychiatric disorders that we're studying and dealing with in, um, in our everyday lives. So I'll start with um, some of the early work that came out of my lab. Um, wasn't that long ago, um, but um, there's been a lot of data in the literature. And so some of the, the coolest things, so my lab is a basic research lab. And a lot of my work has really big picture um, implications for disease, for all of these things. But I also get really excited about really basic behavioral processes. Why do animals, when they do something, want to do it again? And so a lot of what my lab studies is what we call reinforcement learning. And so what reinforcement learning is, is you, you see this with drugs, right? You take a drug, it makes you feel good. You want to do it again. The same thing, the same kind of processes are present for food. We eat. We like it, we want to eat that again. And people across um, a lot of different fields had looked at differences in motivated behavior. So how hard females will work relative to males to, to get food or sucrose, something sweet. Um, and so, you know, a lot of the work and work from my own lab has shown under some conditions, um, females will actually take more food in these kind of reinforcement contexts than males. Um, if you give them access to cocaine, and so um, I told you I was going to tell you about women who inspire me. And so Jill Becker from um, the University of Michigan has basically her entire career has been outlining how females are differentially motivated and there's different neural mechanisms of stimulant drugs of abuse. And so what a lot of her work is focused on is you can put animals in chambers where they can push a button to get drug. And females were actually take um, more drug than males in a lot of these conditions. Not all of them, but many. And so what you could conclude from all of this work is that females are more driven to seek rewards. Um, they do take more rewards, but you can, you can kind of argue this. And so when I started my lab, um, I have, I'll show you the people who've done this work too, because as much as I want to take credit, um, I don't do the experiments. I have amazing people in my lab who have done them. And so when I started in my lab, um, Ganesh Kutlu, who um, was a postdoc at the time, but is starting his own lab um, this year, and Jennifer Zachary, who was a graduate student who just graduated from my lab and is actually going into industry, um, we were kind of talking about how we navigate our environments and how we make decisions in an environment. And I think what's really important to understand is that when we're making decisions to do something, even if it's to eat ice cream, eat a candy bar, the decision isn't only, do I want to do this? The decision is, do I want to do this? And what are the consequences of doing this? And so if you eat too much ice cream, you may feel sick. And so what we're doing is we're balancing the positive and negative outcomes. And this is how we're making decisions. And so what they did is they actually um, went through and did a bunch of really interesting behavioral experiments. And so what they started with was saying, hey, in isolation, we let animals nose poke for a food pellet or sucrose. What does their behavior look like? What if we let animals push a lever to avoid negative things happening in their environment? So we're looking at how motivated are they to take rewards? How motivated are they to avoid bad things in the environment? And so we can look at these in isolation. And then what they did is they said, okay, well, after the animals learn this, what if we give them a choice? And we say, you can either get something rewarding or you can avoid something negative. Which do you choose? And so um, they set out to kind of do these studies. There was a lot of behind the scenes working on parameters to figure out exactly how to do this. And um, what, they, what they found is at first, when we look at this kind of positive reinforcement situation, so what that means is, again, the animal's pressing a button, they're putting their nose in a hole after a cue comes on, some sound. And what happens is we see what, what others have seen before is that under these conditions, females will take more sucrose. So sucrose is just sugar. Um, if we let them poke in a hole, just like the other one after a different cue or tone to uh, terminate a series of foot shocks. So they're pressing to avoid something bad. We didn't see huge sex differences in this behavior. And so, you know, right now you could say, okay, well, females maybe are more motivated to work for sucrose like others um, have said. And not, it's not necessarily wrong. 
But then what we did is we we put them in a behavioral task where these these different cues are presented together. So first, what we did is what we call discrimination. So we're giving the animals cues in isolation, and we're saying, do you know what this cue means? One cue means press for sucrose. The other cue means avoid the aversive stimulus. So we ask them that first. Then what we do is we present in this, what's called the conflict session, we present both of the cues at the same time. And we say, you can do either, which do you choose to do? And so the discrimination trials are really easy. The question is, do they do both of them? And they should, if they know what's going on. The conflict trials, they can make a, three different decisions. In one, they can get sucrose. The other, they can avoid the shock or they can do nothing, um, which they usually do not do. And so what was really interesting in this study is that when we looked at discrimination, which is the ability of the animals to determine what this cue means, there was no difference between the animals. They were both equally able to perform the behavior. But when there was a conflict and we looked at what decision they made, what we found was that about 50% of the time, the males were basically 50-50, they would sometimes get sucrose, sometimes avoid shocks. But with females, what they did was they were avoiding shocks almost all of the time at the expense of getting sucrose. And so you can present this as there's a bunch of models to do this. And what log B is, means is it's just the bias towards one or the other. And so a negative bias in this case means that females are more biased towards making decisions that are involved in avoiding aversive stimuli. And you know, because this is the big conceptual, we actually did this in a bunch of different ways with a bunch of different um, parameters. And every single time what we came back to is that in isolation, yes, females would take more sucrose. But as soon as there was some sort of negative consequence they had to decide about, they were much more sensitive to that aversive consequence. And they were much more likely to motivate behavior to avoid it at the expense of getting positive rewarding outcomes. And so what, what I'm showing you here in this one example, and we're not the only people who have shown this, um, is that female animals, and so these are organ, my, mice, but I'll show you some examples of human work where, where similar kinds of things are seen, is females are more sensitive to the behavioral motivating effects of, of aversive stimuli, so things that are bad. Um, and they prioritize information about them when they're making decisions. And so, you know, I'm giving you an example where there's this foot shock. It's very specific. It happens at a time you can predict when it's going to happen. But aversive stimuli don't have to just be these really obvious things. They can be things like internal states, like anxiety, depression, pain. And what's really interesting is when you start to look at female subjects and women, they're actually more vulnerable to stress disorders such as anxiety and PTSD. Um, they're also more likely to initiate drug use. So when we're looking at women suffering from substance use disorder, they're more likely than males to initiate drug use as a form of self-medication to alleviate feelings of stress and anxiety. And once they're taking drug and they stop, they're more likely to relapse in response to stressors in their environment. And so this is actually really, really important. Also, when we look at female subjects suffering from alcohol use disorder, they also show higher rates of depression and anxiety. And so what we have here is something that we think is kind of a basic behavioral strategy, just how female subjects are making decisions is a little bit different than males. They're prioritizing different information. And because of that, when we start to look at kind of things like addiction, maybe why women and females are taking drug in the first place is different. And what that might necessitate is different kinds of interventions. Um, what I think is really important from a basic science perspective in my field is a lot of the behavioral models we have are really amazing. They're very strong in the addiction space because reinforcement, the drive to do something again when it results in something that feels good is highly conserved across species. Humans do this, um, all of these kind of uh, rodents do this, but also you see these kinds of behaviors, even in, in organisms like flies or honeybees, they also show these types, of, these types of behaviors. But what's really important about them is a lot of our models focus on, do you want to take drug or not? 
And so it's this kind of only positive reinforcement context that's being modeled that's a bigger driver in males rather than incorporating some of these other factors like comorbidities or um, this kind of motivational drive to take drug in the first place that's present more often in females. And so I'm not saying people don't study this at all. I'm saying that a lot of the work we've done and a lot of the work in, in that space is focused on really amazing work looking at the neural mechanism of why animals take drugs that hasn't always in, in, contextualized us in the context of factors that specifically drive female drug use. So I've given you an example of where there are sex differences in behavior. Um, but I think another thing that is really interesting about um, sex differences is that they're not everywhere. You know, when you look at male and female brains, they're very similar in a lot of ways. And so I'm not trying to make this argument that everything has sex differences, it absolutely does not. But what I'm saying is that sex differences can be more complex than we want them to be. They're not always more or less in men versus women. Sometimes they're different. Sometimes the behavior looks the same and the things in the brain that are changing are not the same. But understanding where they're similar and different is actually really important when we think about just developing drugs for these disorders. If we wanna identify targets for any of these mental health disorders, we actually need to know not only where they're the same, but also where they're different. Because there's some drugs that may work better for one sex than the other, and then there may be overlapping neurobiological mechanisms that we can target that would be working in both sexes. Um, and so, you know, I started thinking about this a lot. Um, this isn't actually where my research was supposed to be going. Um, I think when I started, I was a little naive and I was looking at how cocaine changes the brain. And I thought that it would just be, you know, women sometimes take more stimulants. So it would be, things would be more engaged in, in females versus males. And that was not um, what we saw, which is I think kind of the, I don't know, the fun part of my job is the fact that I can have a hypothesis and it could be wrong and it's almost even more impactful than before. And so what a great career where being wrong is actually highly beneficial. Um, so this so this project, um, I've had, again, I said this before, but I've had some really amazing people choose to work for me over my uh, my career so far. And, and they've been absolutely amazing in kind of guiding the direction and, and the work in my lab. Um, so this is Alberto Lopez. And so Alberto was a postdoc with me. Um, and he, um, his background was actually in a lot of molecular biology and biochemistry. And so when he joined the lab, um, we were really interested in understanding how experience with drugs changed the brain. And so my favorite, you know, every neuroscientist has to have a favorite um, brain region. And so um, most of my work and the last thing I'll tell you about is all dopamine work. And so my favorite brain region is actually the nucleus accumbens. Um, when you hear about the brain, um, and so the top is a drawing of a mouse brain, not a human brain, they're organized slightly differently, but they have a lot of the same structures. Um, when you hear about drug addiction, you think of uh, dopamine. And so dopamine um, is in its involvement in reinforcement is really through this pathway that is um, projecting from the ventral tegmental area in the midbrain to the nucleus accumbens. And once it reaches the nucleus accumbens, um, and we're focusing on the nucleus accumbens core. So the, the, the nucleus accumbens is broken up into these different kind of subclass, subregions that can have different functions. But what dopamine is doing is it's changing the way these cells in the nucleus accumbens work. And so it can do this on really fast timescales where you can get really quick behaviors, but it can also do this where it changes the way that these cells are functioning for really long periods of time. And so what Alberto was interested in, it was understanding how proteins in the nucleus accumbens were changed by cocaine and how that related to behavior. And so what he did is he actually um, had, he was, he, we didn't necessarily start this out as a sex difference study. We just include males and females in all of our work because we think it's important. Um, but what he did is he looked at um, males and females. Um, he had them go through what we call self-administration. So they go into this operant box. It's kind of what it looks like up there. They can put their nose in those holes. And what happens is it gives them uh, drugs. So they're basically taking drug themselves, um, which is kind of, I don't know, it's pretty neat. You can basically, all animals will do this. 
And what we did is we said, okay, well, what is changing over time that's really um, being changed by this self-administration history? And what does this mean for cocaine-induced changes in the brain and addiction? And so what he started with, because I think it was really important, was whether there were sex differences before the animals had any experience in the nucleus accumbens in what proteins are expressed there. Um, what he did is he took the nucleus accumbens, he isolated proteins, and then we did uh, mass spectrometry. So what this allows us to do is look at a ton of proteins in this brain region at the same time. So we're not looking at just one thing. We're looking at a lot of things and saying, okay, across all of these proteins we're looking at, what is showing sex differences and what does this mean? And so this is a lot. Um, the, the big thing is, yes, things are different in the male and female brain. And so what's plotted over here on the left, this is called a volcano plot. And so, so things below zero going left, those things are down-regulated in females relative to males, so they're lower. Things on the right are higher in females relative to males. And everything that's pink, those things are the things that were significantly regulated. So those are the things that we think are important. And so if you look on the right, because I'll show you some of these heat maps, what these are is each line here is a protein and it's whether it is in yellow, that means it's um, higher in females compared to males and in blue means it's lower. And so what we found was that there were 112 proteins that differed between males and females. Some of them were higher in females, some of them were lower. And what was really interesting to us is some of the proteins that were different have already been shown to be involved in drug-induced changes in the brain and, and addic addictive behaviors. And so, you know, we thought these differences were kind of interesting because they could predict that the females and males may respond different, differently um, to exposure to these drugs of abuse. And so the next thing he wanted to ask is, okay, we know there are sex differences in the pro proteome baseline. What if we control for these? So we basically normalize the data to each sex and we want to understand maybe even though there's sex differences, cocaine experience is changing the same things. And so what he did was he took animals. So these animals do not have cocaine in their systems any longer, but they've had 10 days of cocaine experience. Um, he did this again where they went through the self-administration experience. He harvested tissue. Um, what's really kind of neat about reinforcement learning paradigms is that you can kind of change the parameters in different ways. And so what we did is we picked parameters where males and females show the exact same behavior. And so what we're looking at here is that over the 10 sessions that they, ha they had access to cocaine, that their behavior looked the same. So they're pressing the lever the same number of times, or their nose poking the same number of times. And we looked at the total cocaine that the animals consumed across the whole training session. There were no differences. And so what we're looking at here is that cocaine, the behavior is the same, the amount of drug they're taking is the same. And we're now looking in the brain and saying, okay, well, does it do the same thing in males and females? So what we looked at now is what we did is we compared the cocaine responsive proteins and the cocaine in males and females. So on the top, um, these are the proteins, and I'll tell you a little bit about what they are in a minute, um, that were significantly changed by cocaine in females. And so again, blue means that they were reduced by cocaine and yellow means they were increased. Um, over here, on the, on the right, those are the proteins that were changed by cocaine in males. And so what you can see is there's about 50 proteins in females, 82 in males. But when we looked at the same proteins in the opposite sex, so if we took those proteins changed in females and looked in males, if these were the same, they should be the same color as the line above. And so what you see is you say, okay, well, those, those graphs don't, those plots don't really look the same. And when we looked at what these proteins were, what we found was that only five of the proteins we identified in this data set were changed by cocaine in both males and females. And of those five, only three of them were going in the same direction. And so what we found was that essentially, animals were exposed to cocaine and they were taking cocaine, their behavior looked identical. But when we looked at what cocaine was doing to the brain, it was regulating completely different proteins between the sexes. Um, 
Alberto was incredibly smart and he said, well, you know, we saw those sex differences at baseline. And so maybe those have something to do with why cocaine does something different in males and females. And so what he did was he actually went through and he compared males and females from each of the groups. And on the top, this heat map is those 112 proteins I told you that were in that were sexually dimorphic that are different between males and females at baseline. And in the bottom, those are those same proteins in animals that have had a history of cocaine experience. And what we found was that after cocaine, only seven proteins were still different between males and females. And so what cocaine was doing is it was getting rid of these baseline sex differences. And he went through and statistically asked this question. And what he found was that cocaine experience was more likely to change proteins that were different between males and females at baseline than proteins that weren't. And so you can see here is that if there was a sex difference at baseline, cocaine was more likely to change that protein than if there was no sex difference at baseline. And so what we were finding was that cocaine, what it was doing was eliminating these baseline differences in the proteome between males and females. So it's kind of complicated. Why, why should anyone care? Um, I think it's, it's important because we're trying to understand like what this would mean for behavior. And so if we come back to this basic behavioral strategy uh, idea that I talked about in the beginning, um, where you see these differences between males and females and some of these really basic behaviors, like how much sucrose they'll consume. Um, what we found was that if animals had no cocaine experience, females would take more sucrose. Um, if we made it harder for them to get access to sucrose by increasing how much they had to work for it, um, females would actually increase their behavior to get it and males wouldn't. And so essentially females are not only taking more sucrose, but they're more motivated to get sucrose um, in that context. Again, it's what other people have seen. It's what we've seen is that in naive animals, females are more motivated to take sucrose when it's in isolation. But if we exposed animals to cocaine like we had before, what we found is that these sex differences no longer existed in these basal behavioral, um, like sucrose self-administration. And so what we found was that, you know, cocaine, even though animals were taking the same amount of cocaine, even though their behavior looked identical, cocaine was regulating different things. And what it was doing was getting rid of the sex differences at baseline in both the brain and behavior. And so when we kind of think about this, my lab thinks a lot about how this relates to different kinds of physiological processes and behavior. What we think is really interesting is that we can show how different sexes respond to drugs, how they respond in different environments. And what I think is cool about this and, and kind of important for our conceptualization of what drugs are doing to the brain is that cocaine is getting rid of pre-existing differences in brain regions in both the brain and in how they're navigating environments and this motivated behavior. What, you know, we've thought a lot about what this could mean and what maybe is happening is that drug experience is getting rid of these basal behavioral strategies to kind of change motivation to focus really on drugs and drug seeking and getting drugs in that context. Um, but what is really, I think the big take home here, and I, I can't go through every protein that was regulated, even though we saw very different proteins induced by cocaine experience, what we found was they actually regulated similar cellular functions. And so it's possible that the effects of cocaine on behavior and the effects of cocaine on how it changes how the brain works are similar between males and females, but the molecular targets and how it's doing that are different. And I think this is really important to understand is that even when disease phenotypes look the same, which they don't always, but even when they look the same, there still could be better targets for men and women that might not be the same because of the fact that these interactions happen between baseline, how the brain is functioning and how drugs and experiences and stressful stimuli are able to interact and change how our brain is being regulated. Okay, so the last thing that I'm gonna show you in the last like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 
is um, some work that I think is really interesting and focuses on other ways. And so I showed you how differences at baseline um, can really influence, you know, why females are making, how they're making decisions. I showed you how these baseline differences in the brain and behavior can change how drugs are even capable of regulating things in the brain. Um, but one thing I haven't touched on yet, which can be really important and interesting and has important kind of developmental and, and uh, lifespan consequences is how hormones influence the function of different circuits and receptors in the brain. And so there's a lot of things that are present in both males and females and look like it functions the same, but hormones can interact with these things and change how drugs can act on them. And so a lot of my work from my early work all the way back to grad school to now has really focused on, you know, how receptors and transporters in the brain are regulated and how they interact with drugs and how these drugs work. And a lot of what we've centered on is, is looking at how endogenous hormone cycles in, in specifically in women, because a lot of my work focuses on centering uh, females as my experimental subjects um, and how this can change under certain conditions, how drugs can act. Um, which is, I think, a really important thing that it's very easy to, to overlook and has important implications not only for basic biology, but also for um, drug development. Um, so I talked about the dopamine system. So again, I have a favorite brain region. It's the nucleus accumbens. I also have a favorite neuromodulatory transmitter, and that's dopamine. Um, so the dopamine system is, you hear about it all the time, people, it's involved in drug responses, motivation, it's a, it's a key player in almost every psychiatric disease state. You know, it's dysregulated in schizophrenia, anxiety, ADHD, um, substance use disorder. And so dopamine is really important to understand, not just from uh, how does it go wrong, but what does it do in a normal situation? And what do those dopamine deficits mean for individuals suffering from substance use disorder? And so my lab, the biggest part of my lab focuses on kind of these questions. How is dopamine released? How does dopamine release? How is it regulated? And how does this, how does this system kind of guide behavior? Um, it's important in the context of substance use disorder because nearly all drugs of abuse increase dopamine levels in the nucleus accumbens, my favorite brain region. Um, this dopamine increase in the nucleus accumbens is really critical for learned behavior, for a wide range of different stimuli. Things that are stressful, increase dopamine in the nucleus accumbens. Things that are appetitive, that rewarding, drugs, food, all of these things increase dopamine in the nucleus accumbens. And so it's very important for this. How much dopamine is there? Is, is really regulated by two things. So how much these cells in the ventral tegmental area are firing. So when they trigger action potentials, that can cause dopamine release. But also if you come into the nucleus accumbens, these cells can be regulated in really interesting ways. And so the reason the dopamine neurons are the coolest is because they send these very, very long range projections across the brain. And when you look at these little terminals where they release dopamine, there's all kinds of different receptors and transporters directly on them that can dictate kind of how dopamine is released, what's going on, how long, it, how long it's there, how much is there, how far it spreads in the brain. And so I think that this is kind of the coolest thing of this, this system is that you have all of these receptors and we still don't know enough about what each of these receptors does and what that means for um, dopamine release, disease, vulnerability. There's all kinds of SNPs, different genetic mutations in a lot of these different um, receptors. Um, I think it's just out of a cool place to, to start. So when we look at these dopamine terminals, we're zoomed in, these are little uh, vesicles that have dopamine in them. And each of these are different receptors that are located on those terminals. Um, one of the really interesting receptors that's located on them is these nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Um, so that's a picture of Lillian Brady from my lab. So Lillian was a postdoc with me as well. She's also starting her um, independent faculty position this year. Um, and so I'm sad to see her go, but she's done a lot of really amazing work in this space um, in my lab. And so what Lillian was asking when she started her work in my lab was whether these nicotinic acetylcholine receptors were different between males and females and what that meant for dopamine release. 
And I think the thing that's really important about this is one, this regulatory mechanism is critical for just motivated behavior in general. But two, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are where nicotine acts. So they are also important and how they work is really important for the abuse potential of nicotine, how individuals take nicotine and kind of, you know, what kinds of behaviors develop after repeated nicotine exposure. And so it's kind of this multifaceted, um, how does this work and what does it mean for vulnerability? So what I'll tell you is this project's a little bit more complicated um, than some of the others because it's less behavioral. And so at the end, you know, at the end of each slide, I'll tell you why this is important. Um, but what's really neat in the brain is you have these dopamine terminals. They have these receptors on them. And acetylcholine is released from all kinds of different places in the brain, but these neurons that release it, what it can do is it acts on these receptors and it can regulate dopamine release. It can determine how much dopamine release, when it's released, and, and kind of how, and I'll talk about a little bit about what that looks like. Um, these receptors are really neat because they are ion channels. They pass all kinds of different ions. Sodium and calcium are the biggest ones that can regulate different mechanisms within the cells. And they also have all of these different binding sites on them that can change how they function. And this is kind of what Lillian started working on is understanding how these receptors and how regulation of them by steroid hormones can change how they work in females. So these nicotinic receptors, what they do is they regulate how any incoming signal in this dopamine cell actually can elicit dopamine release. Um, speaking of amazing women, there's been a lot of amazing women in this field. And so Marina Picciotto from Yale has really pioneered kind of how these work, what they do, how they contribute to nicotine um, self-administration. You have people like Stephanie Craig and Margaret Rice who have outlined exactly how these receptors or the different conformations and subunits of these receptors are even capable of regulating dopamine release. And they've basically, you know, outlined all of the textbook facts about how this works. And so it's just been like, this is one of my favorite fields to be in because it's basically populated by just amazing women doing some of the best science that I've seen. So what did Lillian do? So, so what Lillian was excited about was looking at how dopamine terminals are regulated. And so what she wanted to do is find a way to separate these dopamine terminals, this, these, these release sites, from all of the rest of the cellular components. So she's isolating them. So what she's able to do is she can slice the brain and form these, what we call coronal brain sections where she only has, my favorite brain region, uh, the nucleus accumbens. And then what she can do is she can make these cells fire and cause dopamine release and she can record it with a recording electrode. And what's really neat about how Lillian did this is that she can change how she's stimulating these terminals to mimic what happens in animals when they're awake and behaving and making decisions. Um, what she can then do there, because she's recording how much dopamine is coming out, she can add different kinds of drugs to block these receptors and then look at what that does to dopamine release to try to understand how those drugs affect what dopamine is doing. And what the previous work has really outlined is that what nicotinic receptors do on dopamine neurons is they act as what we call a low pass filter. So when they're activated, it increases dopamine release when the stimulations coming in are really low. And so this is a little in the weeds. It doesn't matter as much, but essentially what they do is if you prevent them from being activated, it increases kind of task relevant dopamine release and reduces kind of the, the noise that's happening in the background. And that's what this looks like. So essentially when you remove this contribution by blocking these receptors, you reduce release when it's low frequency and increase release when it's high frequency. So this is making it so that you don't have any noise. You're just getting these phasic release events that are releasing a lot of um, dopamine. And so this is in males. Other people have seen this. But what Lillian showed was that when she looked in females under most conditions, there was not an effect. The effect was very, very small and, and not present very often. And so we kind of went down this path and I can't show you everything she did because Lillian did basically five years of work figuring out exactly why this happens and how. But she went through and the first thing she started looking at was how endogenous hormones could be regulating this. And so um, estradiol is actually something that has been shown to be really important in dopamine release regulation. And so this is an example of the human menstrual cycle and in, in red is estradiol. And so we have these peaks in estradiol release. 
and they they're basically they dictate kind of what cycle stage you're in. Um, rodents have similar um, fluctuations; they're much faster, and so we don't we're not looking at exactly the same thing, but we can look at how times of really high estradiol or times of lower estradiol can change how systems function. The reason my lab is interested in these kinds of cycle dependent changes is that they're known to change the subjective properties of stimulant drugs of abuse. And so women reported a greater high from cocaine administration when estrogen levels are rising. Um, subjective responses to cocaine are also reduced during the luteal phase when estrogen levels are declining. So in, the, in this phase. And so we already know that estradiol can actually regulate these. And so her next question was, it regulates how some drugs work. What about these kind of nicotinic receptors and how they're working? Um, what I'll tell you, the quick thing is the estrocycle stage didn't really matter for this experiment. Um, whether the animals were in proesterous or estrus when the estradiol levels are higher or in met or, met di or diesterous when the estradiol levels, levels are lower, we still saw no effect. But when Lillian overreactimized the females and, re and removed their ovaries and the endogenous source of steroid hormones, what she found was that she could rescue the effect of this drug. And so what she saw was that essentially these receptors, they're present in females, they can function, but under some conditions they do not. And so what's really important in this context is that you have changes over women's lifespans in hormone levels, in the different hormones and how much hormone is being put out by ovaries that could change how receptors function, maybe not necessarily over the estrous cycle or the menstrual cycle, these really fast changes, but over long developmental windows. And what she ended up finding was that actually estradiol is involved, but it's changing the receptors in a way that is actually just like more long-term and sustained rather than these really transient effects that are happening immediately. Why does this matter? Again, what she found was that estradiol is actually regulating these receptors through interacting with them directly. Um, but what that means is it doesn't just change the way these receptors can regulate dopamine release. It changes the way that agonists like nicotine can actually even interact with them. And so what she did is she did a bunch of pharmacology studies to apply nicotine to these, these dopamine terminals and receptors. And what she found was when she looked at the nicotine effects across a lot of different doses, that females were much less responsive to nicotine, especially at low doses that would increase dopamine release. And so um, it's really interesting is that nicotine at, at this specific subtype of receptor, which are on dopamine terminals, is really less able to increase dopamine release. I'm not saying it won't increase dopamine release through other mechanisms, but this one receptor mechanism that can work is less likely to increase dopamine release. What does that mean for behavior? So the last thing, the last behavioral data I'll show you um, is this kind of cool study. So one of the things that Lillian was trying to do is figure out ways to really understand, you know, how nicotine changes behavior in men and in, in women or males and females, these are rodents. Um, and so what she did is nicotine is really interesting. It's a very weak primary reinforcer. What that means is it doesn't motivate behavior in its own in isolation, but it interacts with cues in our environment to really motivate behavior. And so what she did is she actually did an interesting experiment where she had animals nose poking to turn on lights and different uh, sounds and boxes. And so the animals love doing this. Humans do things like this too, right? We watch fireworks. We like things that are exciting, even if they're not necessarily those canonical things we think of as rewarding. And what she found at first was that females are actually way more motivated to just interact with random cues in an environment and turn lights on. But when she injected animals with nicotine, what she found was that in females, nicotine didn't increase this behavior at all, but in males, it had a huge effect. And so this behavior is known to be dependent on dopamine release. And so what we think is happening is that in females that, you know, they're very motivated but the interaction between nicotine and these environmental stimuli is not as robust because these receptors are not engaged to the same extent as their male counterparts and adult females of reproductive age. And so again, nicotine is working really robustly at this dose in, in males, but it doesn't have an effect at females at the same, at the same dose. And so what's really interesting actually with what, what this project identified is that what she, she shows is that receptor function at this receptor system is regulated 
in females in a way that alters how these receptors are even capable of regulating dopamine release. And so you have a system that's present in most males and females. It's present. It can work the same way and under some conditions, but under some conditions, it does not. Um, these effects are mediated by hormonal systems. And what they do is they change the way the same circuit is regulated between males and females. And so you have a circuit that's there. It can work in males and females, but it's not recruited by the same mechanisms. Um, I think one thing that's really important about this is that these differences can change the way drugs can even work. And so this, the drugs are interacting. They're not doing the same thing. And so this has implications for not only addiction, but also general drug development in women and understanding how hormones may interact with how these receptor systems are working and whether drug targets can interact with them effectively. So to summarize what I showed you is that different behavioral strategies can influence why women take drug in the first place. And so I, what I showed you is that females are more motivated to avoid aversive stimuli and maybe a lot of their, and, and again, there's evidence in humans that a lot of their drug use is starting by avoiding anxiogenic states and different kinds of things in their environment. Even if they're not sex differences in behavior, so like we saw for cocaine taking behavior in our, our models, cocaine induced changes in the brain can differ and it can be different molecular targets that are being changed by these same behavioral processes and the same drug intake. And hormones in females can, can influence how circuits that are present in both males and females can work and how drugs act on them. And so this particular project showed that basically these circulating hormones can interact with receptors in a way that changes the way that drugs are even capable of working. And this can be in mechanism, but also in magnitude. And so I think what's really important is that, you know, what we have is women who make up 50% of the world's population, but we don't have enough research on exactly the factors that drive female disease. And so it's not just about including females in current work, which we should anyway, and that's a great start. But what it's really important to do is identify and understand the factors that are important for disease expression and trajectory in women. And the fact that hormones can interact with receptors in ways that can change how drugs act on them is so important for drug development, but not just for females, for both males and females. Because when we're thinking about getting drugs through these FDA pipelines, we can't have surprises. And if it works in only one population, but both of them are included in clinical trials, these things have implications too for effic eff efficacy and how these things progress to actually get to the clinical populations that need them most. And I think what's really important is that solving this is a really complex problem. And it's not gonna be solved by one researcher. It requires team science and support from funding sources and conversations like this. And the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation has been one of the kind of on the forefront of funding these types of projects and encouraging these discussions in a way that actually really moves us forward um, to these goals. So with that, I'll thank my lab, who is amazing, and all the people who contributed to this. Um, I showed you as I went and talked about a lot of their work. And I'll thank the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation and the rest of my funding for actually giving me the financial resources and the support to actually complete these studies. And with that, I can take any questions people may have. Thank you. Erin, thank you so much <laughs> uh, for the work you're doing, for an excellent presentation on really such an important topic that doesn't get enough attention. It's getting more attention. Um, and thank you for that. The um, one question that I have is we know that um, with regards to chemical dependency, substance use, substance misuse, that younger brains may be more vulnerable. And we're concerned when adolescents and people even through their, their mid-20s may be experimenting with drugs and the effect. I'm curious if, if you could comment on that, um, especially now in the context of uh, many locations making uh, marijuana legal and maybe more, even more readily available for younger people to experiment with. Yeah, I think that's actually something that's really important. So actually one of my, my graduate students, Brooke Christensen, is this is like what she's passionate about is adolescent development and how drugs can interact, one, with development, but two, the different developmental windows can, can change the plasticity that can happen in the brain. 
And so when your brain's still development, developing, these kinds of experiences can more robustly and effectively change the way it functions, its wiring and things like that. Um, I don't think there's enough research on that. I also think, you know, when we're thinking of animal models, um, I think they're really powerful for some things. Um, but when you're thinking about adolescence too, there's a lot of different kind of environmental factors, um, peer groups, um, things like that can influence, you know, how, how, why they take drug, whether they have access to drug. Um, you know, in the Vanderbilt Center for Addiction Research, one of our major goals is actually outreach. And we um, do a lot of different programs where we go to local high schools and um, educate them on, you know, how the brain works, how plastic your brain is at that developmental stage, and kind of what what drugs do in that context. And I think, you know, for a lot of it, one, we need knowledge, but two, we need education to have help people kind of understand how this is happening. And, and it's complicated, unfortunately. Um, yes, yes. Now, thank you for that response. Let me ask you, where do you see the, the work that you and, and your lab are, are involved in um, over the next five years, next 10 years? What do you see happening? Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it's funny because I, I want to give you an answer, but at the same time, you know, it's funny if you'd asked me five years ago where I saw my lab going, I would have been wrong um, because it kind of goes where the people in my lab are, are kind of interested. I think, you know, we we have this really big boom now in technology and when, when I'm talking technology, it's on almost every aspect of science. Um, one of the things I'm really excited about uh, is being able to do different kinds of molecular profiling depending on different cell types in the brain. And so you can identify new targets, but you know you can start to identify targets that have limited off target effects. What should we be targeting? Where is it expressed? And so I think one of the places to go forward is to try to identify things that can regulate drug intake in both men and women. And so, you know, when you think about the molecular targets that are changed, drugs are increasing dopamine in both male and female brains. And so there, it, I guess the way that I'm thinking about it is there has to be something upstream at some point where they converge, some target that's similar between the two of them and trying to understand exactly where those different pathways diverge and what parts of it you could target to actually either reverse drug-induced plasticity or prevent it in both sexes. And so I think this understanding, you know, of uh, where biology differs between males and females and where it overlaps is actually really important because you can use it to develop better drugs that could work at a wider range of people. And so I think either that direction or the other direction that I think is really cool now is doing kind of deep phenotyping. And so these psychiatric diseases are really complex, right? And it's not like disorders where there's a gene mutation and we can reverse it. These disorders are complex. They're they're different. They're experienced different differentially in different people. And so, going through and finding ways to predict what drugs will work in what individual, I think, is a really kind of cool behavioral problem where you can do complex profiling and try to pinpoint exactly which things will be efficacious where. And I think using biological sex as a as a kind of different stratifier is a kind of interesting way to go through and identify targets that may be more efficacious in certain individuals than others. Um, again, such fascinating work. I just, with the picture that, it, the slide that is up right now with your lab members, it, to me, I, I just want to point out to the audience, you spoke about people who are mentors to you, and now you're a mentor to so many others, and this is just how science progresses in such a, a beautiful way. And I think that your presentation really highlights that uh, in the broader scope. Uh, of science and uh, and how sort of the the baton gets passed on to to the next generation over time. Isn't that? I mean, I think that's the best part of my job. You know, I love discovery. Don't get me wrong, but the thing that gets me the most excited is watching young people get excited. And so in my lab, a lot of my work goes in different directions because someone comes to me and says, hey, I'm really excited about this question, and I say, hey, let's come up with a way to address it together. And so, to me creating space for them to be innovative and have resources to do that is like the most fun thing in the world because it means that they're going to do that for the next generation that's going to go on for a long time and solving these complex mental health problems is a multi-generational 
issue. I hope that we solve all of these in my lifetime, but I also want the next generation of the tools to be super innovative in that space. Well, I, I think on that note, very well said. And I could just tell you, if I was a young scientist, boy, would I love to be in your lab. Um, <laughs> well, thank you. I hope they listen and join my lab. I'm yeah. always hiring. <laughs> I, will, I will let people know for sure. Um, let me again thank you for, for your presentation, for the work that you're doing. Um, it, just uh, extraordinary. So thank you so much. I was, also want to thank everybody who joined us today and ask people to please consider making a donation to BBRF. 100% of every dollar donated for research is invested in research. We do this because our operating expenses are covered by separate foundation grants. This means that when you donate a dollar for research, that goes directly to the scientists. To make a gift, please visit bbrfoundation.org or call us at 1-800-829-8289. This webinar has been recorded. If you've missed any portion or would like to share it with others, please visit the events and webinar page on our website. Finally, please join us again on February 14th at 2 p.m. Eastern time when Dr. Shelley Buffington, Assistant Professor, Department of Neuroscience, Cell Biology and Anatomy at the University of Texas will present therapeutic targeting of the microbiome for neurodevelopmental disorders. Thank you, and remember together, we can dramatically improve the lives of those living with mental illness and enable more people to live full, happy, and productive lives. Thank you. <laughs>